Hi, in this video, we want to look at non-negative matrix factorization. Remember principal component analysis? Principal component analysis, I take my original data set and I'm in a situation where I want to have a reduced number of columns for my data so that I can get a better model. All right, why do I want to do this? Number one, if I have a ton of columns, that's going to take longer to process and build models with. So for computation time, I'm better off if I have fewer good, if I have a, a few good solid predictors, I'm better off than having just a ton of, of columns. Another reason why is the more columns I have, the more likely or the more prone I am to overfitting. So if I have a ton of columns in my data set and I try to build a model because of just fluctuations in the data, I'm more likely to overfit than if I was to reduce down my data set. So to reduce the dimension of my data, one thing I could do, I can first of all just go through and do variable selection. And I hope, hopefully you've gone over that in the previous course. Uh, another option is principal component analysis where I take just a few of the components, take the first one, the second one, third one, fourth one, and, you know, I take out, out however many I believe works for my problem. Another option we have is non-negative matrix factorization. Why do we like this? All right, so with principal component analysis, we are assuming that our data, it can go along the entire spectrum of the real numbers. We have negative numbers, zero, or positive numbers. That doesn't really make sense for a lot of types of data, specifically count data. If I have non-negative entries in my matrix, in my, in my observations, principal component analysis doesn't really have a nice interpretation. It's hard to figure it out. Well, non-negative matrix factorization deals with that situation well. So just like the name says, what we're doing, we're not letting there be any negative values. It's either zero or positive. So it's non-negative for all the entries in the factorization. What's going to happen? We're going to get two matrices out of this. The first one is going to be a basis matrix. That basis matrix is my new data set. And it will have fewer columns than the original data set. So I will have reduced down the dimension. The second matrix I'm gonna get from this factorization is a, our topic matrix. So uh, it's, it's called the coefficient matrix in case we're not doing uh, document analysis, bag of words analysis. The, if I'm doing bag of words analysis, this is gonna be our topic matrix. And so what's nice about this is that after I get this, I can go through and I can analyze those topics to get a better understanding of what's going on with my model. Also, I can look through and say, hey, I don't trust it. I don't think that looks good. I don't think these topics look good. Therefore, I don't trust this factorization. Now, this, this is something that makes it more intuitive to understand what's going on with the factorization than with principal component analysis. Principal component analysis, like a few, the first couple of components, the loadings you can figure out, but as you go deeper, it becomes, what is this? I don't understand what's going on. I'm confused. But with non-negative matrix factorization, topic analysis is usually pretty easy to figure out as long as I don't go nuts on the number of topics. All right, so here we're going to go ahead and work through an example. We're going to use the ACQ data set from the TM package. The TM package is the package in R for bag of words analysis. Oh, and this should be a document term matrix. I got that backwards. I'll, I'll do that later. Okay, so I was about I try to save, but it didn't work out. All right, document term matrix. Each document is a row, each term is a column. So here in my original format, and what I get from this part of the code is that I'm saying that each term, individual term in a document, is the count, the number of times that term comes up in the document is my predictor variable. Okay, well, let's see what we get. After I get that, I see that, well, in my original data, I had 50 documents. Okay, okay. Well, how many columns I had? I had 2,103. Wow. So I've got 50 columns and 2,103, uh, sorry, 50 rows, 2,103 columns. Now, if you've taken linear algebra, you know that this is not going to work out if we try attempt to do a regression model. There's going to be some huge, huge, huge problems. There's just too many columns. 
All right, so what we need to do is uh, we need to start like looking through and we want to reduce the dimension right off the bat. I see that that ratio, the 50 to over 2000, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. all right, now next part, this tells me how many entities there are and how many of the entities are not zero. And here we can see that 96% of the entries are zero. All right, so, so something that's going on is that we did not go through and do the string manipulation. We did not stem documents. We did not do stem completion. We uh, you know, did not remove uh, punctuation. We didn't do anything to uh, get, our, get fewer words in the document to make this into a better bag of word model. For this video, I'm just jumping in, I'm diving head first into this and we're just going for it. If you want to actually do this in real life, you want to do first do string manipulation to get rid of like your of weird characters. You want to stem your documents, complete your documents, and then uh, do uh, your document term matrix. All right, so now let's actually do the factorization. All right, so here I'm saying that I want five topics. I want five topics. All right, now this picking out five topics is similar to picking the number of principal components. Now, you don't really know how many you should take in the first place. What you, what you will need to do is you will look at that coefficient matrix after you're done and you're gonna look through and you're gonna go, hey, I think these topics make sense. If you see that uh, there's topics that don't really group together, don't really make sense, then either you, you, know, you wanna look at your documents, see if there is something interesting going on, or you have too many topics in there, reduce the number. If you don't know, go low. All right, so let's go ahead and take a little bit closer look at our factorization. So here we can see that there's 50 documents. We've reduced it down to five topics. This is the number of terms that we have going on. It used the brunette algorithm to factor. Now this is the uh, default algorithm. If you look at the help documentation, you can change this. I didn't bother with setting the seed, so if I try this again, I won't get the same results because I'm lazy. Use the KL uh, distance mat metric. Here are the residuals. All right, so something about this. You will virtually always, you will not get a perfect factorization. You will not, you will get something that is close to, so it, if I went through and I took my basis matrix, I took my coefficient matrix and I multiplied them, I would not get the original data. I would get something close. How close? Well, here are, this tells me what the residuals are. So the smaller this number is, the, cl the better approximation, uh, the two matrices together form the original data. When we do this, we have a loss of data. This is not like PCA, where PCA, I can go back and forth anytime I want between my original data and the principal component analysis. There is some information lost with this but there's some things gained. This took 490 iterations. All right, now, here's a good thing for you to know in data science, and I've not seen this written down anywhere, but I can tell you that this is correct. If you have a ton of iterations, if it takes a long time, long number of iterations to get through a process to build a model, you have a bad model. 490 is okay for this problem, but anytime you get into the situation where your iterations exceed the maximum cap, you probably have a bad model. Here, I don't have to worry about it. And you know, here's the timing. And in general, the longer it takes, the worse the fit of the model. General rule of thumb, something to help guide you, if you notice that it takes a lot of iterations on any model you're building, or it takes a long time for any model you're building, it's probably not the best fit that you can get. <clears throat> I haven't seen that written down, but it's true. All right, so the basis function gives us our new data set. It will have the same number of rows as the original data, or that corresponds to documents, and a reduced number of columns as we're, we have topics instead of terms. This is our reduced data set. The NMF coefficient matrix, their function gives us the topics matrix, and so here, we're going to have a row for each topic and a column for each term. And so what I want to do to see, do I have a good model? Is this a good, connect, good way to go? Do I have the right number of terms going? 
is that I want to go through and I want to inspect the output of this to uh, decide is this good. If the terms group together nicely, like they make sense to me, then I'm gonna say, hey, this is probably a good model. All right, so let's go ahead and execute it. See what we get. And let's take a look at our output. So first and foremost, I want us to look at the document term matrix. 50 documents, over 2,000 terms, 2,000 columns. And we see that our basis has 50 rows and five columns. So I've reduced these 2,000, over 2,000 columns down to five. That's a huge dimension reduction. And you know what? If I build models with this one or I build models with this one, they're, the, they'll probably perform about equally, honestly. So there really is not a huge disadvantage of doing this as long as I'm prudent in choosing the rank. Now on my uh, topic matrix, remember that's from the coefficient function, I've got five rows, one for each topic, and then I have over 2,000 columns, one for each term. All right, so let's go ahead and just slap on column names and row names. Oh, you'll notice I've got 50, then 2,000. I've got 50, 5, 5, 2,000. The 50 and the 2,000 here correspond to the 50 and the 2,000 in the original matrix. And this 5 and this 5 corresponds to the number of topics that I chose previously. If I multiply these two matrices together using linear algebra, I'll get something close, but not exact, to the original document term matrix. All right, so now let's take a look. So here, I'm just looking at the first three few rows. I'm not gonna look at the whole thing. I can see that the, uh, the first document, which is labeled as 10, that looks like that corresponds to topic five. What's topic five? I don't know, but it's with topic five. Now, 12, 44, 45, and 68 all correspond to topic two. And the bigger the number, the more I feel like that is the correct uh, value the correct topic in the output of this actually none of the none of these numbers are actually zero there is so close to zero that when I round to the third digit it looks like zero they're just super small and so if I was to go through if I see different value if I see positive values in two different spots that are like substantially bigger than zero then that makes me suspect that that document is actually dealing with two different topics all right, now let's go ahead and look at our topic matrix. And so here we see that Laval, whatever that word is, is uh, looks like it goes with topic five. American goes with topic one, that. Topic one, any is with topic two. Bridge is with topic four. Now, it, you'll notice that I've got non-standard characters. I've got space here. Actually, no, this is, ah, I have a quotation just kind of hanging out. I have a quotation hanging out. Okay, ellipses. All right, so the original data set was not properly prepared. That's why we get some weirdness here. Um, if I was to go through and, and properly prepare the, the terms, I would get a better model. All right, that's all I've got for you. I hope you're doing well and staying healthy. Bye.